we don't have the engine running long enough to warm things up properly and it would be nice to get a little heat for you so i'm going to run this for a bit it's pretty effective heater on these buses and between what 38 people on board we do a pretty good job of generating our own heat but let's get things up a little bit and then we'll have a nice ambient heat and turn her off Look at this, what a nice way to start the trip. We're getting some sun right away. Really some beautiful colors out here. They are starting to fade, but this has been the most incredible fall I've ever seen up here. It's just lasted and lasted and lasted. A lot of times our peak colors might last about three to five days out here. And boy, they've been going on close to two weeks now. So yeah, enjoy. clouds but this looks like it should be a pretty nice trip if we can just get a little sun there's always some beautiful interplay of sun and shadow out here on the land it's funny actually I came across a brochure earlier this summer we couldn't help but laugh a little bit looking at the pictures about the park a couple things stood out it was sunny in all the pictures there were no clouds the mountain was always out and the animals were always right beside the road but to answer that question, what's the best side of the bus to sit on? I'll get that on the way in. Best way to answer that is this road here is the only road going into the park. This road goes in 92 miles up to Cantishna. As you may have heard, due to an ongoing road slide situation, we are operating only to mile 43, which is the east fork of the Toklat River. And then we're going to turn around and come back on the same road. So in terms of scenery, it's all good. You know, if you're on the right side, you'll get the left-hand side on the return. In terms of animals, we'll see. Every day is different out here. You never know. They market this park with a heavy emphasis on animals. And I have told Park Service as much that I think they need to reorient themselves. They've got it totally wrong. Driving this road 28 years, the star of the show every day is scenery. No doubt about it. So if, I, if this were a meal, you know, the main course is scenery. Around every bend, there's something slightly different. And animals are kind of like spice. There are days out here that we get a pretty spicy meal, and some days it's less spicy. It's always a good meal. You just never know what you're going to get. So, really, if I were to describe our trip, I would say we are going to take a trip into some of the finest subarctic landscape on the planet. It's just absolutely gorgeous, got some beautiful colors out here, and along the way we may see some animals. But the numbers really vary, you know, the, the brochures would have you believe we're going to drive out here and see five or six bears, moose, caribou, a bunch of doll sheep. And it really varies from day to day. You know, the day before yesterday, we saw three bears. We had one right on the road beside us. It's fantastic. Yesterday, we didn't see any bears. We didn't see any moose either. We did get a great caribou sighting. We had some nice doll sheep. Had a coyote. Don't see those every day. Again, yeah, you never know. One nice thing about this trip, amongst many nice things, I'm sure, is that 38 people, that's a lot of eyes, 76 eyes. So you all are my primary spotters. You know, as your driver, I've got a nice windshield on the world up here. But those longer looks where you're scanning the ridges and the hillsides, if I'm doing that, then I'm not watching the road. So basically, you're all the spotters, and it happens a lot where I'm driving along, and hey, I might not see that moose coming up on the right or the caribou on the rig, say. So we have a system on all of our buses that's very effective in letting drivers know. Again, not just my bus, all of our buses. If you see an animal and your driver has not indicated they're aware of it, all you need to do is shout one word. Stop. That's it. I know it sounds a little childish, like something on a school bus trip, but it's all about acoustics you know if you're in the back or middle of the bus and you're saying hey i think there's a caribou over there a lot of times up front here it, it does get a bit noisier right now it's not bad but on the gravel road it's got its own unique noise going up hills these propane engines rev a bit higher and i don't always hear stuff well from the back so don't be shy just holler stop we'll bring the bus to a stop and see what we're looking at some of you got good eyes. We might have some folks that have spent some time hunting before, for example, or maybe a birder or two. Your eyes are kind of trained to look for subtle things, little movements. And that's the way it is out here, too. We are driving into the third largest national park in the system. This park's over 6 million acres. So 
it's about the size of Massachusetts. And as such, unlike the brochures where the animals are always right beside the road, a lot of the time they could be two, 300 yards away. And what you're seeing out there when you see that caribou or bear is not really a clear silhouette of a caribou or a bear, but rather, hey, color change. There's some white out there. It could be the tail of a caribou. Bears out here, boy, this is a tough time of year to spot them because their colors are changing. In the summertime, our grizzlies get exposed to a lot of sun. And as such, they look a lot lighter. I had a lady on board. I thought she gave the best description. She said these summer bears out here, they look like a bale of hay with legs. They're very light colored. But now, look at the gravel on the side of the road. And if there's any wet gravel, they're a lot darker, kind of a brownish gray really blend in. So watch for those subtle things. I had somebody say recently that they were a little bit uh, hesitant to call out stuff because they thought they might be wrong. Listen, don't feel bad about that. It, you know, most of the time what you think you're seeing is what you're seeing. If it turns out to be a dull rock or a grizzly bush or something, it only takes a moment to check it out. And again, like I say, most of the time what you think you're seeing is what you're seeing. I'm all about the effort, so I'm totally supportive of that. Hey, we're off, we'll just uh, continue on. Let's see. A couple more things on animals. Uh, if they are nearby, really important, we want to be as quiet as possible. You know, unlike a zoo, which is an artificial type environment, out here we're driving into the real deal. It's their home, and as such, when we're not around, their lives are very quiet. It's almost like monks, you know, they're just nearing the park. So we're very social beings, happy with conversation. We've got our telephones, music, whatnot, all well and good. But again, with animals, it's a little different. So in the hope that if animals are nearby, they'll be comfortable in remaining there, if not doing so in the future. That's one thing that really helps on animal sightings. And I think you'll find we get animals nearby sometimes, it really enhances the sighting. Good example of this, earlier this summer, had a bear and two cubs down in a riverbed down below us. We pull up on the bridge up above, shut the engine off, everybody's super quiet. I mean, you could hear the water rippling. Cubs are making little cub noises. I mean, it just, the time slows down on those things. It put us right in the scene and it was really a pretty awesome stop. So, yep, nice and quiet. The other thing's equally important. Park Service is really pushing it. And that is, want to keep all heads, arms, body parts inside the bus if animals are nearby or approaching. It's not a safety issue. A bear is not going to pull you out the window or anything crazy like that. It's more a case of keep the green bus green. I think over the years, you know, these animals have kind of gotten used to the bus as not being a big threat. But I've seen it happen where animals use the road a lot. You know, caribou will trot down the road. A bear will use the road. A wolf, a lot of times, they will have a caribou coming right towards us. We keep it nice and green, shut everything down. They'll trot right past us. It's a great photo opportunity. I've also seen, though, where for whatever reason, you know, maybe somebody had a language issue, didn't understand these points, uh, where once I had a guy got half his torso out there with a big lens, they had a wolf coming down right towards us. The wolf broke it off, headed off into the bush, and we all missed out on a potentially good shot. So. Main thing there is, you know, if we do have anybody who may not understand by virtue of language, please translate that point for them because the actions of only a couple of people can affect the bus as a whole. And that's a big one. You can angle your lenses very well from inside the bus. Lens out the window is not a big deal. It's mainly people hanging out the window, resting arms, hanging out there where it gets to be a little problematic. So keep that green bus green. That's really helpful. How are we doing on temperature? You starting to get warm? Let's turn that off and see if we can keep this bus warm on our own. One thing I might mention on bus climate, you all are the boss. So if at any point in the trip, you're feeling a little chilly back there or too warm, speak up. Don't wait till we get to a rest area. Just shout it up and have it relayed up. I'm only a fingertip away. I can make adjustments. For you hikers, it's pretty simple. We'll let you off wherever you want. A lot of you might be on your first trip to the park, maybe not sure where you want. For the record, the number one most popular spot for people out here is the end of the road where we're going. Out at uh, East Fork, there's a bridge. It's not really much of a destination in and of itself to hang out at. But from that point, you can walk. The road continues up Polychrome Mountain. 
uh, up to where the road is blocked off because of the slide. The slide itself is not all that exciting. It's just a big sandy gulch where the area where the road was is given way and it's collapsed and it just looks like a jumble of sand and rocks down below. There's a gravel road through a gravel area. What is exciting about the area is beautiful views. If you're walking back down, particularly in the afternoons, you get those nice afternoon shadows, beautiful view of the river down below, glacial mountains in the distance. For most people, that walk, if you go up to the top and back, anywhere from two to two and a half hours round trip. The riverbed itself is a beautiful walk. Nice, easy walking, nothing steep in there. This is all abstract at this point, you know, explaining this. Once we get a little closer, this will all make sense to you, and I'll reiterate those points. Along the way, though, out here, there are other popular hiking spots, and I'll point those out as we go. A lot of times, people like to ride all the way out, kind of get the lay of the land, and maybe you get off somewhere on the way back, top of Sable Pass, walk down, any number of options. Again, I'll, I'll point them out as we go. If you get off before East Fork, no problem. If you want to catch another bus later and continue on, your tickets are good all day out here in the park. As long as you don't come back to the entrance, you can ride back and forth, do whatever you want out here. So I imagine most of you are just going to come out and have a hike, probably take the bus back. But again, if you want to explore different areas, you're welcome to do that. So just hold on to that ticket stub and you should be fine. Let's see, what else do we want to mention? Oh, buses. Getting back on buses, it's real simple. Let's say you've done a hike somewhere, you're walking down the road, you're ready to get back on, just flag us down. It's like a hitchhiker's dream. You give us a hitchhiking sign or act like you're hailing a cab. The reason I mention that too, you know, is that the fact that people are on the road standing there doesn't necessarily mean they want to ride. Uh, the road gets a lot narrower farther out, it's gravel. And as we get out there, a lot of times people walking the road will stand on the side and just wait for us to get safely by before they resume. So if you want that ride, give us a proper hand signal. We'll stop and pick you up. This time of year, things are winding down. It's still pretty busy this time of day. But as we get into the afternoon, buses are going out with like seven passengers, which means 30 some odd empty seats. But here's the deal. I mean, if a bus is full, we will still stop. We'll find out how long you've been there. We'll call in your location to dispatch as in, hey, I got three people out here, mile 31 westbound, I was unable to pick up. Dispatch keeps track of this stuff and is needed. They will send out extra buses called sweepers. And they're an empty bus. Their only job is to add capacity out there. They're not on the schedule, but it's just more seats. The whole idea is to get people out of the park more efficiently. I have a copy of the schedule. I don't have extra copies, but if you would like a copy, the thing that works best, take a picture of it. You got a cell phone or a camera, you can take a picture of the uh, return eastbound schedule or whatever you like, and you're good to go. And if that's the case, just see me. We're going to have a rest area in about an hour here. We'll take a 10 minute break, use toilet facilities, and uh, again, check with me anytime on that. We'll help you out. What else? Oh, a couple last things feel like Lieutenant Colombo, one last thing now. Uh, buses out here, we get asked all the time, what's the difference with these buses? You're going to see these green buses. There's also these beige buses out here. We are all operated by the same company, Doyon Aramark. We don't actually work for the Park Service or the federal government. It's a private company has got the concession contract. As for buses, you can hitch to any of the green buses. These are the transit. When you were making reservations, you might have noticed the option for tour. I have a lot of people ask, what's the difference? Tours are tours. They don't run on a schedule like we do. They can lolly around out here and stop, get on and off the bus, take pictures, do all that nice stuff. And they get a box lunch and they get driver commentary. So that's the tours. They run up 140 bucks, I believe, and we're like 30 bucks. As for these buses, I had somebody on a few weeks back who said that reservations had told them that the green bus drivers don't say anything. Here, I've been talking nonstop since we started. But here's the deal, folks. There are drivers that are fairly taciturn out here, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, from my perspective, there's a lot of cool stuff out here in the park. I'm more than happy to share information with you. At the same time, I've sat in the back too, and I think it's nice, if not necessary to have times, you know, where the driver isn't talking all day. Nice day like this, we get a little blue sky and sunshine out here. 
I think you'll find this park is more than eloquent on its own behalf. So I feel like I can fill in the blanks, things the park can't tell you. You know, why are the rivers so broad, only a little bit of water? Bears, if we're lucky enough to see a bear up close, the bears here are quite a bit smaller than their cousins. We're talking grizzly, that's the only kind we're gonna see today. But the average grizzly here in Denali weighs about three to 500 pounds. The big ones you see on all the wildlife programs, standing in the rivers catching salmon, seven to 900, some of the island bears get up over a thousand. So there's reasons for that. And at appropriate times, things come by along the road that'll help explain that. So I'm more than happy to pitch in. If you got any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Just shout it on up. I'll do my best to get you an answer. And lastly, the road here is open to all of you anytime you like, with your own vehicle. Have any of you driven out here? Yeah, it goes out, it's paved up to mile 15, Savage River. We'll point the area out anyways. The rangers come on and give you a nice greeting. But uh, yeah, there's no time frame. It's not like it closes at seven. You're a light sleeper. Best time to see moose out here? Early morning, late evening middle of the day like this we haven't been seeing as many but let's keep our eyes open anyways look at these beautiful colors this is incredible that we still have this it is fading higher up but look at these reds and oranges the bush that's providing this is called a dwarf birch we don't have the deciduous trees like your hardwood forest say back on the east coast so they are kind of the standard bearer for spectacular fall colors but this is pretty nice in its own right too and if we're fortunate enough to get a little sun and lighten this up oh it's spectacular so yeah the road's open though if you don't have a if you don't have a vehicle uh, you're more than welcome to just take one of our three shuttles we've got a system out here called the savage river shuttle runs from 7 a.m i believe the last westbound bus leaves the dvd the bus depot at uh, 6 30 p.m so every half hour and again if you don't have a car or even if you do and don't feel like driving we'll take you out here for free mile 15. all right well that about covers my pre-trip anybody have any questions about the trip i haven't answered temperature's good all right well keep a good eye out like i say you're all my primary spotters you know a lot of times with moose sometimes we're lucky 20 feet off the road a lot of times it might be on that hillside over there so watch Watch for those little things. The big four, as we call them, are moose, caribou, doll sheep, and grizzly bear. And if only due to size alone, those are the big four that we feel like we have a reasonable chance of seeing any given day out here. There are a lot of other animals out here in the park, but given their size, coloration, behavior, you know, the landscapes, they can be a little harder to see. Wolves, we've got about 95 wolves in the park. I've seen one wolf all summer. That's it. The you know, wolf population, we get a few more heavy snow years, wolf population will go up. Animals that eat off the ground, doll sheep, caribou. When you get a lot of snow, it's hard for them to get the food. They're not as well fed, they're weaker, they got to struggle through deep snow. The wolves do very well on those winters, and we had just such a winter this year. We get a couple more of that wolf population will rise nicely. Coyote, I saw a coyote yesterday. There's a family of them over by the uh, east ramp of Sable Pass. Wolverines, my roommate saw a wolverine yesterday. Unbelievable, don't see them very often, but they're here. Lynx, the only wild cat out them. in Alaska. Or, about somewhere. beaver, river otter, muskrat. Four different types of squirrels, snowshoe hare, martens, big weasel pretty active park but again some of those animals are pretty small how many of you seen Denali you live here yeah, <laughs> yeah. you got lucky banks. well they have what's called the 30 percent club here in the park and that is to say only 30 percent of park visitors get that great view of Denali I like what I'm seeing out here you know there's a lot of blue sky there's a number of vantage points along the way where we may get fortunate to get some views. Right now, the mountain would just start to be coming into view if this was totally clear. And I like to use a clock system for locating stuff. So pretty simple. The front of the bus is always 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock behind us, 3 to the right. Look out here about 11 o'clock, you'll see a low rounded mountain on the horizon. 
and coming up to the left of it, there's like a little sawtooth range of mountains. Look we'll at all these trees. In the in Denali, we're out. There's no mistaking it. It's the only huge, totally snow-covered mountain out there. It is massive. And I might add, if you're driving down to Anchorage, there is an excellent viewpoint on the Parks Highway, mile marker 135, which is 103 miles south of this entrance to the park. That's a great view. We're 45 miles from the South Peak. Very rugged on that south side. And again, I hope you all get a chance to see it. It's, it's an impressive mountain. Sign on the right, warning, moose are extremely dangerous. They are. You know, we sometimes think, well, they don't have fangs and claws. You know, how dangerous can they be? Moose were not given the gift of speed like deer and elk. They, those animals tend to flee when they see us. Moose hold their ground. You know, in place of speed, they were given a healthy dose of attitude and aggression. They're beautiful animals. I think it's pretty nice. They're fairly tolerant of us to a point but they do have an area about them that they are comfortable with and they have no problem with enforcing that. And when you've got a thousand pounds of animal bearing down on you, you can be badly injured. So the trick to moose is, you don't really need to be fearful if you see a moose out here hiking along or if you're driving along in the car and there's a moose, but be respectful. I think that's a good word. Use, use the telephoto lens where people get into trouble is creeping up, trying to get closer, get a better view. We all hear stories every year of people getting gored by bison in Yellowstone because of just that kind of activity. But a lot of good cameras out here, so utilize them. You know, get a good photo, and uh, you should get a great picture. And moose are, moose are wonderful animals. Very, like I say, there's a tolerance, not tameness, but they're they're pretty tolerant of us. It's a straightaway. I'm not sure why that driver is always applying their brakes. Could be trolling for moose, and although the speed limit is 35 out here, you're welcome to drive a little slower if you want and look for animals. Being the scheduled run we are, that's one thing that they always put a good word on. Take advantage of the speed limit, it'll help you maintain schedule. We are not a Swiss train, so if we're running a little late, it's not the end of the world. But uh, along the way, you know, we do see things, we'll stop. If the mountain's out, we'll stop. If we see animals, we'll stop. It adds up. Coming up ahead here, I think is a great spot, if the mountain's out, to get a photo. There's going to be an old dry creek bed bisecting the road. And I'll show you. It is right here. And if you were to stop, say right about here, that creek bed leads right to the mountain. It's like a driveway going right out to Denali out there. Any confusion, there is a pullout here on the left and there's a plaque. So if you stood in front of that plaque, you're looking right at Denali. But I assure you, if the mountain's out, there's not going to be any confusion. 20,310 feet, highest point in North America. A few years ago, I had a gal ask, uh, where, where does Denali rank amongst the world's highest peaks? And at the time, I didn't know. You know I figured, gosh, maybe 40th or 50th. There's a lot of peaks in the Himalayas and the Andes that are higher. Yeah, but it's interesting. Went and looked it up. And it seems to vary. You know, people consider certain mountains sub peaks, others consider them separate peaks. But on average, Denali is about the 115th tallest mountain in the world. 
a lot of peaks in the Himalayas and quite a handful in the Andes. But where Denali stands above them all, according to the National Park Service here, is that it has the highest vertical relief of any mountain on the planet that starts above sea level. So vertical relief is not the measurement above sea level, that's the standard there. But vertical relief is the physical rise of the mountain. So to measure that, you start at the base, whatever elevation that may be, and you're just measuring the rise, the physical mountain. Like me, say I'm six feet tall. If I'm standing on eight, a two foot high box, then my head is at eight feet. In the case of Denali, it's basically starting at about 2,000 feet, very low base here in Alaska and rising up to 20,310. So we're looking at 18,000 feet of vertical relief. Mount Everest, the world's tallest, starts on a high Himalayan plateau at about 15,000 feet. So it's 29,028. It's a 14,000 foot high mountain on a high plateau. But yeah, Denali, for that reason, on sheer size alone, not only in terms of the rise, but the mountain itself is massive. Have any of you been flight seeing? Yeah. It's a great way to see the mountain. Sometimes you can get a freebie with the airlines if you're flying like Fairbanks to Anchorage. You get a nice clear day every once in a while. Pilots will get permission from air traffic control to take a spin around Denali. And even in a Boeing, it is a good sized mountain. Looks like we got someone waiting for a bus. We'll see if it's ours. I believe our pickup was at Teplanica, but let's see. Let's see tickets. Interesting question yesterday, I had somebody ask, is Denali the original name of the mountain? I think that's a fair statement. You know, a lot of us grew up knowing the mountain is Mount McKinley. But, of course, you go back, you know, people came across the land bridge 14,000 years ago. The Athabascan natives, who make up the interior tribe in the central of Alaska, have long known the mountain as Denali. To the south, different tribal groups have known it as Doleka or Trelika. And certainly McKinley is a very recent name. Uh, the mountain was named for President William McKinley. In fact, he wasn't even president yet. Uh, the mountain was named for him during the time he was running for president in 1896. And the story there was that the big election issue that year was whether America should back up its currency with gold or silver. And gold would seem like a no-brainer, but there were people who felt we should follow the British model as the British had backed up their pound with sterling silver. So McKinley was known as a gold standard champion. His opponent, William Jennings Bryan, favored silver. Well, up here in Alaska, there was a group of gold miners led by a fellow named William Dickey. And Dickey was not just some old guy with a pickaxe. He was a pretty bright guy, Princeton graduate, traveled all over, had different jobs. Now he's up here mining and he was writing about his Alaska adventures that was being published in the New York Sun newspaper and the National Geographic. And in this article that he wrote, he mentioned that upon emerging from the Alaska wilderness, the first news his group of gold miners got was that McKinley had been nominated to run for president. 
and with McKinley supporting the gold standard, and here's a bunch of gold miners, and the mountain as yet, not really having been given an official name, they recommended naming the mountain in McKinley's honor. Certainly back then, it was not at all uncommon to name things after politicians, regardless of their relevance to an area. The name was adopted, and it stayed, it actually stayed officially Mount McKinley up until 2016. And at that point, the name of the mountain was officially changed, some would say restored, to Denali. Not Mount Denali, just Denali. It means the high one or the great one. And I would say uh, restore is a fair word because, you know, locally around here, people, natives, have been calling it Denali far longer uh, than it's ever been called McKinley. And here in Alaska, I think, people, it wasn't out of any disrespect to McKinley, but I think people always wondered why the mountain was named for someone who, through no fault of his own, never had a chance to get up to Alaska and see the mountain. Uh, McKinley, unfortunately, was assassinated in office. And he wasn't involved in any legislation particularly relevant to the area, so it just seemed a bit odd, you know, that here's the most prominent mountain in North America named for someone who had nothing to do with it. So. Around here, to be honest with you, most of us just call it the mountain. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Did you see the mountain? Oh, yeah. So coming down here, for those of you that may not have driven out here, this is the end of the line for private vehicles. You'll see a big parking lot. And if it's filling up, you see the cabin on the left side of the bridge, just turn down that road and there is more parking in there. Very popular trail out of here that goes down the river canyon. It's called the Savage Loop Trail. Easy walking, trail goes down about one mile down the right side of the river. There's a bridge over the river and then you can walk up the other side. Looks like these people are doing exactly that. You can see the trail heading off here. And worth noting, behind us, there's a trail that goes very steeply up the hill. And it's called the Mountain Vista Trail. It's about three miles and it goes back to that campground where we just stopped and made pickup. And that's popular walk. It was closed yesterday because of bear activity up there, which the reason they close the trail down here just because of bears in the area is I think having more to do with the sheer numbers of people. For those of you out hiking somewhere in the park, there's always potential of a bear out here. And normally bears mind their own business. They don't have much interest in us. But that said, when you got a whole lot of people, they tend to try and avoid that. I see they're waiting for us here. So let's check in. We'll talk more on animals and hiking here in a bit. Good morning. We have less than 38 picked up too, so we have 40. Right. There we go. Hi everyone! Hello. Hey. How's it going? Hey. Love the enthusiasm. There we go. Out of sleep. Welcome to Denali National Park and Preserve. My name's Emily. I'm a ranger here. Uh, you all are here at a really special time of year you're getting to witness. Denali's famous fall colors. So it may look a little different from where you're from. A lot of the colors here are in the lower growth, in the berry bushes and the dwarf birch and even the lichen. Of course, the aspen and the birch trees have the beautiful golden color. It doesn't last very long, so consider yourselves lucky. Um, there's always something fun and exciting to see in the park. Remember, leave no trace and have an excellent trip out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. That was good. Oh, thank you. There you go. These are so nice to us. <laughs> Let's see. So what do we say? Oh, 40. Yeah. 40. Yeah. Good to go. Thanks, Emily. Gravel for the most part, you know, the 
boat crew out here does a great job keeping the road in pretty good shape. Thankfully, we haven't had a lot of heavy rain. That tends to help contribute to potholes. So as we're driving through here, again, watch these hills. Stuff like this on the right, it's all good moose habitat, especially look at this mixture of these yellow bushes or willow, diamond leaf willow, and then you got the spruce trees up here. That is moose heaven. They love that. The willow is the number one food in the moose diet. And moose get right in amidst this willow and the spruce trees, and they can be difficult to spot. You know, again, largest animal in the park, maybe the hardest of them all to spot. But hey, sometimes they're out in the open too. You could have a moose standing out here perhaps. Caribou tend to be more out in the open. The caribou here are what they call barren land caribou, not woodland caribou. So they're more comfortable out in these open areas. Watch for those white tails. Yesterday, we had a good group of ptarmigan up here. That's our state bird of Alaska. Ptarmigan are ground-based birds. Kind of look like big whales in a sense, but uh, they're a very pretty bird in the process of changing their plumage from a nice summer mottled brown to totally white during the winter. They're year-round residents up here.
down here about 11 o'clock, you'll see that rounded valley. And that's classic glacial signature. This whole area was under ice 22,000 years ago. In fact, we've had four different ice ages, if you will, in the last 2.8 million years. So often, you know, we talk about the ice age like it's a singular event. And in some areas it may have been, maybe down in Minnesota, just a one-time deal. But up here, yeah, four different glacial advances, as the geologists like to say. But you take a few million tons of ice and run them through a mountain valley for a few thousand years, and they tend to grind and smooth and polish off those rough edges. The timelines on geology are incredible. It's, it's nothing to hear about, you know, the rocks, for example, the mountains on the left side of the valley back here to our behind us, 400 million year old metamorphic rock, much younger sedimentary rock on the right side of the valley, but 400 million years, or glaciers that were as recently as 22,000 years ago, you know, you look at our timeline, if you live to be 100 years old, that's a good long life. America just had its 246th birthday, that seems like a long time ago to 1776, and yet, you know, we're a very young country. A uh, 1,000 years ago was the year 1022, serious dark ages. And that's only one one thousandth of one million. So yeah, amazing timeline. Spinelli here, they say that the bulk of the rise of the Alaska Range, including Denali, has only been over the last six million years. Mountains like the Appalachians, for example, are, are much, much older, hundred well over a hundred million years old. In any event, looks like it, things are even getting a little better. So as we come around a couple corners, I'm going to go past that tour bus, and not by much, we'll stop and take some pictures. Again, we don't have the luxury of getting on and off buses like the tour buses do. We'll just lower our windows. Folks on the left, just share your windows with your friends on the right. They'll be doing the same for you. You know, if you look to the left, in fact, that's kind of a nice photo. I don't know if any of you want that. It's lost a bit of red, but there's still a lot of red and yellow down there, and you get a nice view of that big valley. It's up at the top. They come down from the top. Yeah, got to push both tabs in. If you've got long fingernails, maybe you want to get somebody to help you out because it can be a step. Got to do them both at the same time. It's not that difficult. Just push both. Both tabs in at the same time, and put some elbow grease into it. There you go. All right. So I was at a <coughs> talk by some glaciologists some years back, and this particular valley we're looking down you can see how it's nice and rounded. This is a really larger version of a glacial valley. But based on glacial debris left up on the side walls on each side, they estimated the depth of the ice in this valley at one time was about 1,200 feet deep. That's a lot of ice. That's only one valley. Anytime we have a stop, too, on a big, broad landscape like this, it always pays to take advantage of that moment to scan for anything moving out there. Those white-tailed caribou. No self-respecting moose would have a white tail. Yeah, there's still a lot of orange and red, though, out here. It's beautiful. What is, what is the name of that red plant? So the red ones you're seeing out here are dwarf birch, as in dwarf, D-W-A-R-F. And they're also giving us the oranges. The, the yellow you're seeing along the road here is the uh, willow. 
And then lower down, there's some mosses and lichens, some blueberry plants give us that nice red leaf too. Alrighty, gang. We'll wrap it up and we're on our way. Four, three, two, one. All right. Hey, on windows, it's worth noting, you're in charge of your windows, but if you leave your window down, you may be affecting people around you with breeze coming in. So just communicate with each other, work it out. But yeah, that's a factor on windows left down. Let's go around the corner. We'll go down just a little farther and get a nice shot of Finale. You get it? So you're getting the right flank there. You see that big wall in shadow? That's known as the Wickersham Wall. It's one of the longest continual slopes anywhere in the world. If you set off on a toboggan at the top, it's 14,000 feet. Straight line distance. Down the thank you, thank you. Hey, we want to get the Notley with the thing down. Oh, yeah. That's the picture now he stopped for. Just push him in. There you go. <laughs> so gang let's uh, one thing once we drop down here we won't see the mountain for about an hour and a half till we get up top of sable the clouds it's not unusual for clouds to kind of hang in there around the top but we're going to have a number of vantage points farther on yesterday it was like this yesterday we got a, not even this much but by the time we came back yesterday afternoon it had improved considerably we got the north peak at least so the North Peak's kind of triangular. It looks like it could, you know, it's a more dramatic looking peak, but it's not the true summit. The true summit is more rounded on the left side. And, you know, it's interesting. The other day, something came up that I'd never really looked into before. Somebody asked, what's the fastest climb of Denali? And on average out here, most climbers take about 18 days to get up and down this mountain. You can put it up now. So I had no idea. I figured, I don't know, what, five days maybe? Try 11 hours and 44 minutes. Amazing. This guy lived at high elevations, either in South America or Tibet or someplace, and he trained and he'd run. He'd literally run up and down mountains. And we looked him up last night. He, uh, he likes to set records. He's looking to try and do Everest in 22 hours. Amazing. All right, we good to go? There we go. Again, if at any point things are feeling a little chilly back there, don't hesitate to let me know. <laughs> Look at that. It's amazing. You 
can find this one only here in Denali, Denali, Alaska. <laughs> Almost going to say California.
this little campground here, Sanctuary, is what they call a walk-in campground. There's no cars, only seven sites. These are nice places though, nice and quiet. They've got a building you can store your food in and just a nicer, quieter little spots. Well, where it has an interesting historical context is that this was originally a work camp for the Alaska Road Commission, the people that built this road. And that kind of ties in with the early park history. The park, this park's on its 105th anniversary this year. So when the park was commissioned as Mount McKinley National Park back in 1917, Alaska really didn't have any infrastructure to support tourism back then. You know, there were no roads connecting Fairbanks and Anchorage. Airlines did not fly up here. The only means of getting up here was on a steamship out of Seattle. But then once you got into Valdez or Seward, getting into the interior was extremely difficult. The railroad was just getting started under construction. So here you had this brand new national park, but no way to get here and no place to stay. So the park sat empty the first five years of its existence. And what generally spurred development up here was the arrival of the railroad in 1922. Once that railroad arrived here coming up from Anchorage, continuing on, the tracks are being built from Fairbanks to southbound. But once the railroad reached here, then they could bring in heavy equipment and they started building this road the next year. It took 15 summers to get this road built all the way out to Kantishna. So when the road opened in 1939, lots of celebration. There was one little problem though. There was no road to get to this road. So if you wanted to drive it, you had to put your car on the train, offload at the park station and then drive in. So fairly expensive proposition for most people and you know, visitation remained a little on the low side. But it's, it's all about access here. You know, if you get better access, people will come. And that's exactly what's happened. The Denali Highway was built in 57. Now you can drive here, long trip, 15 to 17 hours from Anchorage. The Parks Highway is what really opened the floodgates. That's the road you drive now. That opened in 72. And suddenly, Anchorage is four and a half hours, Fairbanks is two. So visitation here in the park more than doubled that first summer that the Parks Highway opened. Cruise ships are a major component of the, the uh, overall tourism numbers. They really discovered the inside passage back in the 70s, and that's become a big deal for cruises. The Alaska Highway had major improvements over the years from what started out as a World War II supply road to one of the world's greatest road trips. You know, driving up here through Canada is spectacular. So, bottom line, more and more people, you know, a lot of folks coming in from overseas, Prices are a lot lower to get travel around the planet than they used to be. So as of 2019, the last year before